Hello, I'm Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York, and you're watching Royal Report. When the Prince and Princess of Wales married in April 2011, Prince William made it very clear that the well-being of his wife and their future children would remain his top priority. He's made good on that promise in recent weeks as he's taken a step back from forward-facing engagements in order to care for Catherine behind the scenes as she recovers from surgery. Still, the work continues. We have learned that Earthshot Prize, the Earthshot Prize giving ceremony is going to take place in Cape Town in November. Williams conducted a couple of engagements and he was at the BAFTA Awards for which he's been president since 2010. But he's come under fire in the last 24 hours or so because of a statement he released about the conflict in the Middle East. Dad, there is so much to get into here, but I think it's a really important topic. And I think it's one that we need to add context to because Nigel Farage, I thought, made a very dismissive statement when he said William needs to stick to the BAFTAs and leave political statements to uh, the powers that be and indeed political figures. Um, I thought it was a very close minded comment to make because based on William's speech, he didn't call for an actual ceasefire. He didn't dictate the terms of a ceasefire. He didn't uh, say what needs to happen. And so all these people saying he's treading dangerous territory, I think perhaps are looking for scandal where there isn't any. So as someone who worked very closely with principals behind palace walls and as someone who was very astute in terms of what that delicate balance was in terms of, of a foot in the political camp. What were your thoughts? My thoughts were that he did the right thing, as you rightly say, um, and it's open to interpretation. I don't believe it was political for a moment. It was humanitarian. Uh, he called for more aid uh, to get through. He was um, saddened by the loss of life. He said he talked of the act of terrorism on October uh, the 7th. He actually talked about that on October the 11th last year, a short few days afterwards, as does his father, not through a statement from him, but a representative of him at Buckingham Palace. So he made all the right noises. Unfortunately, they're always going to be criticised. As Prince of Wales, he can kind of get away with it, much the same way as his father got away with it, when his father was controversial when it came to the environment environment, organic farming, architecture, the arts, medicine, you name it, he talked about it and he was controversial. And I don't believe for a moment that William was being political, but he was being humanitarian. And that's an important point to make. Nigel Farage dismissing it. Well, Nigel Farage hasn't made a, uh, a sensible comment in his whole political life. So I don't think we should take any notice of him. Um, but there are all sorts of um, political figures coming out saying, no, he shouldn't have done it. But you go out and ask the great British people what they think. And they say, yeah, good on him. You know what, Dad? I, my feeling was the Foreign Office was OK with it. Downing Street was OK with it. William has been at Sandringham. Chances are, we don't know this for certain, but chances are he discussed it with his father. He was likely OK with it. So why we should care what Nigel Farage has to say, you're absolutely right. But I do think that you just hit on a key word here, and this is what plagues members of the royal family, and that is interpretation. People don't take what they said. This is what's on the page. This is what they said. They interpret it to suit their own agenda. And we have seen so much of that in the last 24 hours. And I think this is why members of the royal family are advised not to dabble in certain territories because their words are going to be taken out of context, misconstrued and interpreted. So how do you prevent that? Very difficult to prevent that because every, United Kingdom is a free country. There is freedom of speech and people will say what they want to say. They will interpret. They won't see what 
and say what is actually on the page. They will interpret what is on the page. What did he mean by it? They're not in his head. They don't know what he meant by it. What is there and what he meant by it is there in black and white on the, on the statement that was released and it was humanitarian. It was about the awful and tragic loss, uh, loss of life. It was about the terrorist attack and he hopes one day for, for a, a solution. Um, it's very difficult when you're in that position of being a member of the royal family. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. He's being damned because he has done. And if he hadn't done anything, people say, well, you know, what's the point of them if they're not going to say anything? He learned from his dad what to say, when to say, how to say it. Um, and you take the flack for it. You're exactly right. And yes, I think he has learned so much from his dad. But I also, and I I'm kind of loath to sort of draw the comparisons with Diana because that sort of happens ad nauseum. But it was the humanitarian side of things that really struck me because, as you will know, famously in 1997, when she visited Angola and, and uh, was working against landmines and a reporter went up to her and said, ma'am, what do you think about what they're saying in London about you? And Diana didn't know this at the time. And they said they're calling you a loose cannon for getting involved. And of course, that will have hurt deeply because she was just trying to make a difference. Uh, and she said, I'm not here as a political figure. I'm here as a humanitarian. Now, it was slightly different because at that point, she and, and then Prince Charles were divorced. She'd lost her HRH, but she was still Diana, a, a globally influential figure that was going to be on the front pages of papers with whatever she saw. So I think what we're seeing with William here, once again, is the very best of both parents. He learned from both of them and he brings their greatest attributes to the table in his role. Well, you know, you mentioned Diana and, and uh, the landmines issue in Angola and um, there on behalf of the Halo Trust who were responsible for the clearance. She did, by her very action, kickstart governments to do something about landmines. Up until then, they'd been dragging their heels, doing absolutely nothing. And what is quite interesting, if you remember, when Harry and Meghan went to Southern Africa, Harry went to Angola, he went to Huambro, which is where Diana went, which is now a thriving town. Before that, it was bush and it was full of landmines. So she did do some good. Uh, and she did some good by the uh, very action in the fact that landmines has become an issue with governments who were involved in conflict before independence, after independence, and it is something that's being tackled by the Halo Trust and other organisations. It was remarkable actually, wasn't it? Because we saw Prince Harry retracing her steps and when she had walked through, it was just a bushland, a landmine field, and Harry was walking down a thriving, bustling street. Um, and yes, I think credit where credit's due, she led that charge and, and look where they are today, and I think they're very grateful. Um, I think what a lot of people were missing as well when they were sort of tearing William to shreds over, over this speech was the fact that it was released, uh, not speech, statement, um, it was released ahead of two very important engagements. Yesterday he went to the British Red Cross, Red Cross headquarters where he was learning about their humanitarian efforts to provide relief and aid to Gaza. Um, next week he's going to be visiting a synagogue to highlight the rise in anti-Semitism. And we have to remember that one day as king he is going to preside over a country that is home to Palestinians and Israelis. He's not looking to alienate any group here. I think he's expressing what all of us feel, which is that we'd all like to see an end to the fighting as soon as possible. And we'd like to see those hostages returned to their families. We would like to see peace. But I think what was interesting with William as well is that he was coming at it from being the very first senior royal to visit the occupied Palestinian territories, he was profoundly moved by that experience when he went. Um, that could have been deemed controversial as well, but he went with the, at the bidding of the Foreign Office uh, with the Prime Minister's approval. Uh, later, then Prince Charles followed. Uh, William certainly wasn't the first royal to visit Israel, but he was the first there in that sort of formal official capacity visiting both states. Um, and I think he brings an element of, of personal experience to this. And so this wasn't just a off the cuff, I'm just going to say something. This would have been incredibly well thought out and, and pondered over. It would have been well thought out. It would have been pondered over. As you rightly said a few moments ago, it did have the approval of the Foreign Office and of Downing Street. And they are important because no 
uh, statement of that nature is ever made without the approval of government. And William did seek that approval of government, the right wording. And what is quite interesting, you sort of mentioned that William went to the, to, to the West Bank, the first royal to ever have done so. But let's not forget that the king's visit when he was Prince of Wales, he, he visited Israel, he visited Bethlehem, he met the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, there was no controversy about that. Um, he also met the Israeli leaders as well. So, you know, politicians and, and uh, people coming out the woodwork do have an agenda. They don't like it when the royals say things, but then a majority of people do like it. They want to hear. They want to know what the royals think. And if the royals don't say what they think, then they will question, why have a royal family? And for a politically neutral institution, their job is to reflect the policy of the sitting government. And I think that's what William did. Um, we like to, on this show, bring it to a very human level. Um, yes, that is Prince William. Yes, he enjoys enormous privilege, benefits that so many of us could never dream of, let alone actually experience. But he's also a person with feelings and emotions and a desire to do good. And I have to say that based on coverage over the last two weeks, particularly online, I have to wonder if sometimes William wakes up in the morning and says, why do I bother? And I kind of just want to go back because I, I want to just illustrate to people what a difficult position he is in. So he went to the uh, Air Ambulance Charity Benefit Fundraiser. Um, he is patron of the London Air Ambulance. He was the very first um, heir to the throne to hold down a civilian job. He was an air ambulance pilot himself. There was a deeply personal connection to that event. It ended up being the charity's biggest fundraiser ever. So they were thrilled with it. Uh, but people criticized him immediately for just showing up. And it was a celebrity event because Tom Cruise happened to be there. Rather than focusing on the charity, there was criticism. It happened again with the BAFTAs. Uh, he showed up as president of BAFTA. He was there. BAFTA is a charity, uh, an arts charity. He was there to promote and support British film, British industry. People were criticizing him because it was a celebrity event. And why isn't he just doing some of the smaller charities? So it's kind of feeds into what you're saying, Dad, about damned either way. Then, of course, we learned over the weekend that he is going to be overseeing and he is personally invested through the Duchy of Cornwall in building 24 homes in Newquay that are going to be social housing. He's doing everything he can to ensure that they look and feel homely. He's surrounding wraparound services, mental health, employment support. There's going to be bus connections. This is a big picture project. Just this morning, I read one of the critics saying, 24 houses, is that it? Is that all he's got? And it's like, you have to start somewhere. And to his credit, he is seeing what the Duchy of Cornwall is capable of doing, what he is capable of doing during his tenure with it. There's got to be a point where we just cut the man a little slack. Yeah, well, there's also the added, you mentioned 24 houses, there's also 4,000 houses of which 30% of them will be affordable houses. Uh, and that makes a lot of difference. Um, yes. And just to be clear, that was a project that started under then Prince of Wales when, when the king was still Prince of Wales. And so William That's is picking up the baton, but also putting his own stamp on it as well. He's picking up the baton and putting his own stamp as well. He's got to pick up what is already in the pipeline and needs now to push it ahead in order for it to come to fruition, and he will do that. But to add another uh, batch of accommodation for, for the homeless, it's very important that, that the duchy is involved, and it would only be involved doing things like that with a, a proactive Prince of Wales. Charles was a proactive Prince of Wales. William is a proactive Prince of Wales. And in the fullness of time, one hopes that George will be as well. But let's talk about the present. William is a proactive Prince of Wales and he's going to make sure that what is already in the pipeline and what he wants to see happen is going to happen and it's going to be happening over the next few years. And this really isn't a vanity project. Homelessness is something that he has been passionate about ending, 
possibly, certainly um, working to reduce it uh, rather than just managing it. He wants to prevent it. We know there's been frustration for him in terms of government policy of just managing it. And this goes back to when he was 11 years old in 1993. His mother took he and his brother Harry to visit the passage. Clearly, it, it made a profound impression in 2005, Centrepoint, which was one of Diana's charities, uh, one of the forward leading homeless charities in the UK. That was William's very first patronage as a member of the royal family. And he doesn't just show up to engagements. He goes there behind the scenes. He volunteers during the pandemic. Uh, the passage said that he was there on multiple occasions, masked up, serving food, doing what he could to help. There were no cameras there. This is not a performative exercise. But I also want to kind of tie in the King to this as well, because Diana is the one who is, always receives the credit when it comes to working with homeless charities. But the King was very involved as well. And William made a point of mentioning his mother and his father during a speech at Centrepoint. Um, so again, it speaks to William looking to his parents for guidance in the same way that he looked to his late grandparents for guidance to see how he can further the work that they started and build on it by making it his own. He did. He, he did mention his parents. He did get guidance from both his parents. You mentioned that uh, Diana took uh, both he, William and Harry to the passage. She also drove slowly through the streets of London so they could see homeless people living on the streets, not just in, in sheltered accommodation uh, or in hostels, but actually on the streets. And that had a profound effect on him, which is why he's so passionate about the uh, the housing on on the duchy why he's so passionate about center point and a, a, and about homelessness it is a big issue here in london in in every major city in the world it is an issue but he wants to tackle it here in the uk and he's raising the profile and what i do admire about william and this is not to be rah rah william but um i think again credit where credit's due what I admire in his approach, whether it's homelessness or conservation and what he's doing with Earthshot, there is always a note of optimism. And that has been something that he has very consciously embraced because he has said previously in, in relation to his conservation work, if you're just down and everything is doom and gloom and this is the end of the world and we're never going to restore nature, it's very difficult to get people to contribute and to get people excited. And so there has been a, a huge dose of optimism in terms of his approach to the, this housing project and the work he's doing with Homewoods, likewise with Earthshot. And the next Earthshot prize giving ceremony is going to take place in Cape Town. And it just so happens that this year marks the 10th anniversary of a conference on the illegal wildlife trade that was attended by then Prince Charles, along with Prince Harry and Prince William. In the 10 years since, huge strides have been made, but still so much needs to be done. And so I think with the prize giving week, which Earthshot uh, now facilitates, we don't know for sure if William's going to go. I'm sure he wants to. That will be announced nearer the time. But I can see William tying in his work on behalf of the illegal wildlife trade into Earthshot as well, because it all comes under the same umbrella. And that's where I think he's been very smart. Uh, this younger generation have far fewer charities than their forebearers. But I think that's been a conscious decision, because if you're spreading yourself so thin between 700 organizations, you can't get to the nitty gritty of the work that needs to be done. But when we look back on William's tenure as Prince of Wales, what he will have done in terms of homelessness, mental health and conservation, I think historians are going to be giving him the credit he deserves. Yeah, he's a very positive young man. He doesn't think in terms of, yeah, we'll try to do it. It's we will do it. And everybody else around him will be encouraged by that sort of attitude. He has, yes, as you rightly say, has reduced his his commitment to organisations. It's important that he focuses on a small nucleus of organisations that he can devote full time to, rather than spread himself thin, a bit like Diana, a bit like the Queen, went to, had a lot of charities, didn't go to most of them uh, over her 70 year reign. 700 charities, you can't cover that sort of thing. So he is committed to that nucleus of charities and they will thrive as a result of his, his benefit. 
William understands there's always going to be criticism, but criticism where it's due. I think if we can all join together and remember the late Queen once said, it's easy to hate and destroy, it's far more difficult to build. And I think what William is trying to do is to build and to cherish. So please let us know in the comments section below what you think in terms of what William is trying to achieve. Did you think that his speech crossed over into political territory? What do you think about his housing initiative? We'd love to hear your thoughts. And please do subscribe, ring the bell and click like. We look forward to seeing you next time on Royal Report. Thank you.